we're going to start talking about differential equations, specifically, mostly systems of two differential equations and two unknowns. I should even be more specific. We're going to talk about two, a system of two linear differential equations and two unknowns. So here are a couple examples of some differential equations. And I'm just going to throw in some stuff from the book real quick. So here's 10.1 problem number two. I'm not picking any of your homework questions because I'm going to leave them for you to do. So let's say we have this system of differential equations, dy dx equals 2y, and dz dx is equal to x minus z minus 3. Is that, there's a plus 3. So there are two things I want to ask and answer here. The first is, is this system autonomous or not, or non-autonomous? Well, this was a terminology you might have learned either in 17A or 17B. And all this really means is if you're writing system in different equations, so here's what we're saying. When we write dy dx, we're basically saying, we're talking about the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to twice y. So the derivative of y with respect to x depends on y. And here, the derivative of z with respect to x depends on x and z. So the way I kind of think about autonomous versus not autonomous is, how do I say this the right way? And it's always like, let me, let me actually look at one thing real quick. So I, it's easy to get backwards. Can it stand on its own? Kind of, yeah. So like, the system is autonomous if the essentially here, okay, here's, if the lower if the variable that's in the bottom of your derivative isn't in either of your equations. So I would say that this system is, and I, and really like I always get these backwards. So I really want to make sure I'm not saying it the wrong way. So let me double check just to be sure. Um, so this first one is non-autonomous, correct? Right, independent of the zone. Sure. So, sorry. I was, I'm always just worried I'm going to say like the wrong, wrong thing. So, yeah, so these first would be non autonomous, non autonomous, specifically because dz dx depends on x. The other question we want to answer is, is this system linear? To answer that question, it's not quite enough just to look at the powers of all your variables, but essentially a system is linear if each variable is only multiplied by a constant. So if I look here, each variable in this equation is multiplied by a constant. Each variable here, x and z, are both multiplied by constants, one and negative one, respectively. So the answer is yes. Each variable has a constant multiple. Um, so let's look at another example. We'll kind of see some of the opposite things. So let's look at, yeah, that's a good one. So let's look at this one, which I'm going to modify. So let's say we have this following system. dx dt is equal to xy minus y, and dy dt is equal to 4x plus x. Why? So first things first, is this autonomous? Yeah, both of the differential equations don't depend on the independent variable. So we are autonomous. Right? We don't depend on T. The other question is, is this linear? 
And this is where you might accidentally say yes. The system is not linear. So one way people kind of think about being linear is every variable is raised to the first power. That's not quite right because this term here, this x, y term is not a linear term. So x times y isn't linear. This is definitely non-linear. X times y makes it non-linear. That's kind of all there really is to this. Is, is determining whether or not your differential equation depends on your independent variable or not, and whether or not you have coefficients that are other than your constants. Now, here's the reason why we're asking these questions. In this class, we're almost exclusively going to focus on autonomous linear differential equations. I'm gonna throw in a mostly there because at some point I think we do look at some nonlinear ones, but we're definitely gonna start off linear. So an example, so kind of a standard example of what kind of differential equations we're gonna look at are the following. Um, dx dt equals five x minus three y and dy dt equals, I don't know, negative two x plus y. So one thing we're gonna often do is write this system of linear differential equations as a matrix equation. So here's, there's like probably two or three good ways of doing this. One way of doing this is writing as the following. I'm gonna actually write out the derivatives as a vector. So here's my derivative vector, dx dt, dy dt. And the nice thing about the matrix I'm gonna write, the two by two matrix I'm gonna write, it is always just the coefficients of the variables here. So it's gonna be, five, negative three, negative two, and positive one, times the variable vector, x, y. That's it. Now you might see in the book, this get written. Now I can't make boldface type with my pen. So usually when we write vectors, we write them with an arrow above them instead of trying to write a boldface. So we would call this, now it might feel kind of weird to call this x, but we often call this x even though there's an x and a y. Sometimes it's a dx1 dt and a dx2 dt instead of an x and a y, but kind of the same thing. x1, x2, or x and y, they both work. Oh, I forgot to bring my water. Oh, well, I'll live. Um, and then we would say this is the matrix A, and then this vector over here is the vector x. That is often how you, oh, oh, I made a small mistake. Not really a mistake. I just didn't write the left thing correctly. That shouldn't be the, the vector of x, it should be the vector of x prime. It's the vector of derivatives. Yeah, so this is another way of writing it. So, yeah, we should probably, so let's see, let's see is there anything else I really want to look at before we do that? No, yeah, we should take, okay. So now, so that kind of addresses all the questions you might have to answer from problem one through 14. Oh, we should do one other. So yeah, that one's kind of weird. Let's look at, so I'm going to look at problem 13, just for example. So 13 says to write each system of linear differential equations in matrix notation. So here's our system here. Now, normally you won't be having to do this, but it's a good problem. So x plus 4y minus 3t and dy dt equals, what do I got here? y minus x. So I want to write this as a matrix equation. And I'm going to do the same thing, except I've got something a little extra. That negative 3t there is really unwanted. We don't love you. It's OK. Ignore it for the moment. Pretend like it's not there. So we're going to say dx dt, dy dt equals, OK, so the rest of the stuff, usual coefficient matrix. We get one, four. Ah, they're trying to trick me here. I was going to write one, negative one. That would be incorrect because the coefficient that should go here is the coefficient of x. And the coefficient that should go here is the coefficient of y. So if I was writing this in more of a standard way, 
I would have rewritten this part as dy dt equal to negative x plus y. It's a good idea to write your variables in the order that's typical, meaning x before y, or if you're doing x1 and x2, x1 before x2. Because in the first column, you're going to want your x coefficients. In the second column, you're going to want your y coefficients. I suppose I could check, right? If I multiply this out, do I actually get what I'm supposed to get? Well, I get 1 times x plus 4 times y for the first entry. Yeah, that's what I want. Well, almost. And for the second entry, I get negative 1 times x plus 1 times y. Yeah, that works. Now, what about this last part over here? Well, anything that's not x or y, just add on with another vector. So I'm going to add on a negative 3t in the first component and a 0 in the second component. Um, the difference between these two types of equations is this type of equation where there isn't anything added on. This is called a homogeneous system. When you hear the words homogeneous system, you should think to yourself, oh, that means 0, 0 is a solution. If I plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, is that, oh, I should say, if I set this equal to 0 and plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, is that a solution? Yes, it is. Right? If I plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, I definitely get 0. If I plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, I definitely get 0. Here, that's not the case. If I plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, I'm going to get negative 3t, which may or may not be 0, depending on the value of t. So this is definitely a non-homogeneous system. Most of the time, we're going to be dealing with homogeneous systems. You might be wondering, why would you be setting this equal to zero? Well, because the big picture is that we're going to be looking for points of equilibrium or where uh, points of stability, another thing, right? We want to know where we have equilibrium, where we have stability. In other words, we want to know where things aren't changing. And if things aren't changing, what do we know is true about the derivative? This is where I would take a drink of water so you all could think about it for a moment and then answer the question while I pretend to drink water. If, if, if things aren't changing, what is the derivative going to equal? Yeah, it's going to be zero, right? If the derivative is zero, nothing's changing. So we're going to be doing a lot of taking this equation and seeing where it's or solving it equal to zero. But the thing is, most of the time, especially for these homogeneous systems, the answer is just going to be the origin x is 0, y is 0 is going to be the only point of equilibrium. That's going to evolve later on. We're going to see some non-linear equations where you get different equilibria. But for the most part, starting out, you're just going to get the origin as your only point of equilibrium. And then we're, the whole kind of work we're going to do next is figure out how to classify what kind of equilibrium do we have. Is it stable? Is it unstable? What kind of pattern does it have as you move either towards it or away from it? So that's where we're going with this. So, yeah, let's see here. How much do I have to go? So just as a reminder, and this is, this is going to come back. So I'll, re I'll remind you. From last quarter, we definitely have talked about solving equations like this. dx dt equals to some multiple of x. You might recognize this as the differential equation that leads to exponential growth or decay. Because you're saying the rate of change of x is proportional to x. Or if you like the words better, the rate of change of the population is proportional to the population size. So as the population grows in size, the rate that it grows at gets faster and faster. The solution to this is x as a function of t is equal to c e to the k times t. We can totally verify this, right? If you check it out, dx dt is equal to c times the derivative of e to the kt is e to the kt times k. But look, that's equal to x, or x of t. So this really is equal to 
k times x, exactly like we said it was. So that's the solution. And that's definitely exponential growth or decay, depending on what kind of value you have for k. So this, right, you're going to get exponential growth if k is positive. If k is positive, James? Yeah, k is positive. You need something like this. And you're going to exponential decay if k is negative. And yeah. So the idea is we're now going to kind of extend this into a system of two equations and two unknowns. So let's go ahead and look at the following system. So our system is going to be. Uh, let's do it that way. dx dt equal to negative x plus 2y. And dy dt is equal to negative 3 plus 4y. And we want to, yeah, sorry, my brain is like, the idea here is we're going to try to solve the following equation. So just like before, where we were solving, ah, come on, paper. The derivative of x is equal to a multiple of x. Now we're going to try and solve the derivative as a vector is equal to a multiple of that vector. So what we're really going to try and solve here is dx dt, dy dt, equal to some multiple of x and y. That might look kind of weird for now. You may be thinking, James, hmm, I don't know about that. So let's actually rewrite it. So I'm going to write dx dt dy dt as a vector as what it's equal to in terms of matrix multiplication. So dx dt dy dt is really equal to this matrix. Well, that's not a matrix. I'm pointing at that and saying there's a matrix there. The matrix is negative one, two. Oh, I forgot an x there. I'm sorry. Apologies. This should be a negative three x. Negative three, four. Times x, y. And we are trying to figure out when is that equal to k times x, y. You might recognize this question if I use different words. We're trying to figure out when a matrix times a vector equals a constant times a vector. In other words, we're trying to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix, negative one, two, negative three, four. So, and this is really kind of true. For these systems of two equations and two unknowns, so I should say two differential equations and two unknowns, finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors is essentially the process we're going to use for solving the differential equation. So just like before, the solution to the differential equation was something like CE to the KT, where K is that constant multiple. Here, we're going to get the same sort of thing. We're going to get something like CE to the KT, where K is the constant multiple, AKA, the eigenvalue. So, oops, that's kind of I mean, to be not. So let's do the work of finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues in this matrix, and then we'll kind of come back and talk about what that means. So, which one do we have to find first? There's definitely one we find first, and one we find second. First, the eigenvalues. Now, I know we talked about eigenvalues at the very beginning of the quarter for a day. And I said, we're going to come back to it. Well, now we're coming back to it. And the thing I want to remind you about, or the thing I want to, not remind you, the thing I want to let you know about is the eigenvalues are kind of like the big picture. We're going to get to a place where someone's going to say, here's a system of differential equations. Tell me what it looks like. Tell me what this phase plane looks like, which I know we haven't talked about yet. But it essentially tell me like what the behavior of the system is. And all you're going to have to do is find the eigenvalues. And you're not going to have to think about the eigenvectors. 
the eigenvalues kind of tell the entire story about whether you have stability or instability, whether you have things spiraling or things going straight in. It's kind of cool, but it definitely takes a little bit of building up. But I just want, so, so your ability to find eigenvalues is kind of super important, right? Something you should definitely make sure you are good at doing. And we'll talk about this kind of a couple of different ways of doing it. So let's do it the usual way. We're gonna find the determinant of A minus lambda I, and we're gonna set that equal to zero, and we're gonna solve for lambda. All right, so let's see, A minus lambda I is gonna be negative one minus lambda, two, negative three, four minus lambda. I'm gonna take the determinant of that, and that's gonna be negative one minus lambda times four minus lambda, minus two times negative three, I'm going to set that equal to zero. Um, I should mention, at some point, you will get some imaginary eigenvalues. Right? You're going to get some complex numbers where you're taking square to negative. So don't be, don't be afraid of those. Right? They're going to come up for sure. Those are when you have the spirals. If your eigenvalues are imaginary, you have spirals. If your, if your eigenvalues are real, you don't have spirals. So let's see. Let's simplify this. So I'm going to get, let's see. Uh, lambda squared, and then I have a minus four lambda and a plus lambda, so a minus three lambda, and then a minus four, and then a minus, no, a plus six is gonna be a plus two. So factoring, I get lambda minus two times lambda minus one equal to zero. So my eigenvalues are lambda equal to one and lambda equal to two. So eigenvalues for a equal to negative one, two, negative three, four, R. And I would label them as lambda one equal to one and lambda two equal to two. We typically label the eigenvalues as lambda sub one and lambda sub two. I would not label, like usually it doesn't matter which way you label them, but if one of them is one or two, it's often a good idea to call that one lambda sub matching number so you don't get confused. Okay, so now, Let's find the eigen. Oh, mm, this is probably a good time to mention the other way of doing this. So you can totally do it this way. It totally works every time. But sometimes the numbers are messy. So there is another way of finding the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix. And it's the following. So we're going to find two things for the matrix. We're going to find the trace, which we often label as a tau. And the trace is just the sum of the diagonal entries. So in this case, the trace is negative one plus four, which is three. And the determinant of the matrix, of the matrix without the lambdas in it, we often call a capital delta, and it's going to be negative one times four minus two times negative three, which is gonna be negative four plus six, which is two. And really, so here's what's really happening. When you are finding the quadratic equation that you're gonna get from doing the determinant of A minus lambda I, the determinant of A minus lambda I is always going to equal lambda squared minus the trace times lambda plus the determinant. Just like, oops, sorry. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Just like we had here, right? Lambda squared minus the trace times lambda plus the determinant. And so what you can do is you can say, well, if I know the trace and the determinant, then I can just throw those things into the quadratic formula and say, okay, if I'm setting that equal to zero, then my solutions are going to be Lambda equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4A all over 2, sorry, 4AC all over 2A. But here our A is 1, our B is negative tau, and our C is delta. So that we get lambda equal to negative negative tau plus or minus the square root of negative tau squared. I can ignore the negative sign there because if you square a negative, it's still positive. Minus 4 times A times C, all over two times A. So 
that's another way to find the eigenvalues. And sometimes it's very convenient. So especially because I know there, are, I'm pretty sure there's some problems where it's just like, here's a matrix or there is a matrix. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm going to tell you the trace and the determinant. And with that information, you can totally figure out what the eigenvalues are. Um, some people talk about this in class, some people don't. I imagine Dedell probably will, because he usually likes, he's kind of a, if there's something to cover, he likes to cover, like he likes to cover all the things. So you will probably see this in class. It's possible you won't. But this is another way of finding the eigenvalues where you don't have to write out the whole thing. Either way is good. Either way works. Really, I should say you should do what you're most comfortable with. There are things about looking at this that make you kind of, so, so we'll get there. But seeing out, what I'll say is if you write it this way, sometimes it makes it easier to talk about what kind of solutions you have, what kind of stability you have, whether it's stable, unstable, spiral, not spiral. So writing it this way can kind of make it more clear what we have. Okay, back to what we're doing. So let's find the eigenvectors. And they're gonna off a little bit. I'll probably, for a while, probably do it both ways to make sure that people are seeing it both ways. Um, so to find the eigenvectors, we are going to solve A times our unknown eigenvector equal to lambda times our unknown eigenvector. And again, you can do it this way. I should say, right, we're solving for V. Or you can do it this way. So you can either solve AV equal to lambda V, or you can solve A minus lambda I times V equal to zero. And both are also good. And here's what I would say, really. If your eigenvalues are nice, meaning if they're integers, do it this way. It's going to work out great. If your eigenvalues suck, if they're like have square roots in them or have imaginary numbers, it's often a better idea to go this way. And I will definitely show you that as we get there. Um, but let's go ahead and find our eigenvectors. So I'm going to take my matrix A, negative 1, 2, negative 3, 4 times the vector V that I don't know equal to the eigenvalue. So let's do it for um, lambda one equal to one times again, the vector I don't know. And all we have to do here is typically use one of the equations. So I'm gonna use my first row equation. So negative one times X plus two times Y equals one times X. And then I'm gonna solve for Y. 2y equals 2x, y equals x. So the eigenvector is the vector that lands on this line, meaning it starts at the origin and one of its terminal points is on the line y equals x. The normal choice here would be the point 1, 1. So we can say that our, eigen, our first eigenvector is the eigenvector 1, 1. That's the way most people do it. But you could literally say anything. You could say it's 2, 2, 3, 3, negative 7, negative 7 whatever two things that match, except for you couldn't pick what, what's not allowed. Zero. Right, you can't pick zero, zero as your eigenvector. The zero vector is never an eigenvector. Any other choice is fine. And then for lambda two equal to two, I would do it the same way, but let's go ahead and do it the other way so you can see what happens. So for lambda two equal to two, I'm gonna do, a minus lambda i. So I'm going to do negative one minus two, and then two, and then negative three, and then four minus two. I'm subtracting lambda from each of the diagonal elements. I'm going to multiply that by my unknown second eigenvector, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. So the difference here, the way I think of it, is when you do it this way, both equations become the same, right? Your first equation is negative three times X plus two times Y equals zero. And your second equation is negative three times X plus two times Y equals zero. So doing it this way, both rows essentially are mimics of each other. Now, I will say if your eigenvalues are not nice eigenvalues, a lot of times these two rows look very different even though they're representing the same equation, which is why it's good to do it that way. All right, so this one's going to give me negative 3x plus 2y equal to 0. So 2y equals 3x. And this is where I would say x is the coefficient of y, y is the coefficient of x. 
So my eigenvector here is going to be the vector x equal to 2, y equal to 3. Again, there are lots of other valid choices, but that's the choice I have to make. Okay, so now we started off by saying we wanted to solve an equation, right? We were trying to solve dx dt equal to negative x plus 2y, dy dt equal to negative 3x plus 4y. And we found for the matrix A equal to negative 1, 2, negative 3, 4. Our solutions, or not our solutions, our eigenvalues were lambda one equal to one with an eigenvector of one, one, and lambda two equal to two with an eigenvector of uh, two, three. So here's the deal. Once you have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we can write the system of solutions. So just like, or I shouldn't say just like, but analogous to like before, where you're we trying to solve, I know we said it before, but we'll write it again. We were trying to solve dx dt equal to kx, and we got x equal to c e to the kt. Now we're trying to solve, and I'm going to write it very, very matrixy like. We're trying to solve dx dt equal to a times the vector x. And we're thinking that our solution is probably going to be something like x of t equal to c e to the a? Well, that's not quite right. It's the idea, though. We can't, have, well, that's not, so I'm about to say something that's not entirely. There's weird branches of math where you can totally have a matrix as a power. It's bizarre stuff, though, and it's not what we're doing here. But the idea here is instead of using the matrix as the power, we're going to use the eigenvalues as the power because they kind of are standing for it. So our solution is going to look like the following. Our solution is going to be that X as a matrix, and we'll write it out bigger in a second, is going to equal C1E to the lambda 1 t times the first eigenvector plus c2e to the lambda 2t times the second eigenvector. Let's write it out bigger. So what we're really saying here is that the solutions x of t, if you like, and y of t. So I should point out, when you're talking about x and y in this context, there's always kind of an implied x as a function of time, y as a function of time. And we could imagine that x and y, like that x is maybe some predator population and y is some prey population. dx dt is the growth rate of the predator population. dy dt is the growth rate of the prey population. And so this seems maybe somewhat reasonable, right? The predator population grows at a rate that is smaller if there's less predators and bigger if there's more prey. That seems reasonable. So the thing I was saying though is that it's always kind of implied that your things are both functions of time. It doesn't have to be time, but it's usually time. So that's going to equal C1, which we don't know what C1 is yet. We're going to find it maybe. E to the one times T times your first eigenvector, which was one, one, plus C2 times E to the two T times your second eigenvector, which was two, three. And now what I would really like is for you to believe me. Meaning, I'm not just gonna ask you to believe me, I'm gonna show you. So this is the general solution to this equation up here. I should say this system of equations. So very, very generally, if you're trying to find a solution to system of equations, it's going to be 
C1 e to the lambda one times V1, so e to the lambda one T times V1 plus C2 e to the lambda two times T times T2. And here's the great part. We can totally check it. So let me show you what I mean. This is where things are going to get a little bit messy. That's all right. So let's write it again. Here are my supposed solutions. Now we could write this as one kind of thing, meaning I could combine this out and say, okay, well, I've got C1e to the t times one plus C2e to the two t times two. And then the second component would be C1e to the t times one plus C2e to the two t times three. So that's our X and T, and T. And what we're trying to show is we're trying to show that those are solutions to this system of equations. So let's check it out. Let's find dx dt. Well, there's X of T. Let's take the derivative. It's going to be C1 e to the T plus C2 e to the 2t. Oh, the derivative of e to the 2t is e to the 2t times 2, and then there's also another 2 there. And similarly, dy dt, if this is our solution, should equal derivative of c1e to the t is c1e to the t. The derivative of c2e to the 2t times 3 is c2e to the 2t times 2 times 3. And I suppose you can simplify that. It's c1e to the t plus 4c2 e to the 2t. And this is c1 e to the t plus 6c2 e to the 2t. Let's check. Is that actually equal to negative x plus 2y and negative 3x plus 4y, respectively? Well, let's see. Negative x plus y. Well, there's x. There's y. Let's do it. Negative x plus y is going to be negative c1 e to the t plus c2 e to the 2t times 2 plus c1 e to the t plus c2 e to the 2t times 3. Now I'm like, I hope it works. I'm worried it's not going to work. Oh, oh, wait, did I forget something? Oh, oh, I did, for, I, I totally forgot something. You guys see what I forgot? Something important. I mean, everything's important. Oh, you can't see it because you can't see it. So I found dx dt equal to that. And I want it to equal negative x plus 2y. Right, that's what it's supposed to equal. I forgot the two. And now let's check it out. Negative c1e to the t plus 2c1e to the t is c1e to the t. And negative 2c2e to the 2t plus 2 times 3 is 6e to the 2c2e to the 2t is 4c2e to the 2t. And look, that's exactly what we got for dx dt. So here's the point. The point is, yeah, the thing we said is a solution is a solution. We have shown, at least for the first component, that this value here solves this equation. The dx dt is in fact equal to negative x plus 2y. And in a similar way, we can show, let me try and keep everything on, on the page here, that dy dt should equal this. And if we look at dy dt, well, it's supposed to equal negative 3x plus 4y. That's going to be negative 3 times c1 e to the t plus 2 c2 e to the 2t plus 4 times c1 e to the t plus 3 c2 e to the 2t. And if we combine these together, let's see, I get a negative 3 times this plus a 4 times this. That's going to be one of those. And I have a negative 6 times this plus a 12 times that. That's going to be a positive six of those. And look, that's exactly what I have right there. 
So, okay, I know it's kind of a lot of like a lot of symbols, right? There's a lot of stuff written on this page. But the thing to take away here is that, oh yeah, if we're trying to find the solution to the system of equations, it's really just this nice general formula where the solution is some constant times e to the lambda one t times v one plus c two times e to the lambda two times v two. And so finding the solution to the system of equations really does boil down to just finding the eigenvalues and finding the eigenvectors. That's all that really, really matters when you're asked about finding the solution to a system of equations. We might later extend this just a little bit and say something like, um, what if we're given some initial conditions? So we might, in fact, let's go ahead and do that because it is kind of worthwhile. So yes, it's a solution. So yes, x, y equal to c1 e to the t times 1, 1. This is usually my preferred way of writing it. Plus c2 e to the 2 t, 2, 3 is in fact the general solution to the equation we started with, which was, um, where'd you go equation I started with? Sorry. Brain. Negative one, two, three, four times x y equals ah, brain. Sorry, yeah. I know we're kind of backwards. Sorry, what was that? Show all that? No, no. Probably. Not. Sure. Um, I mean, well, so I would say it's it's not that. It's, I know I've made it not look particularly easy, but it's really not as bad as maybe it looks. You really like if you're trying to sh if you're given a solution, and you're asked to show that it's a solution to right to this equation. If you're given x and y, all you have to do is take the derivative of x, which I know isn't particularly pretty calculate it and then take negative X plus two Y. And just like I did over here, right? Show that both DX DT and negative X plus two Y are in fact the same. Sometimes you just do lambda and T though. Sometimes you just do lambda and T? Yeah, like, and like some of the solutions, uh, like the one I did on mm -hmm. last time, like this class, mm -hmm. they, they only give you lambda and T and they give you like this. Problem. Okay. Hmm. I feel like I feel like I need to see a little bit more. I mean, I'm I imagine there's probably enough information there, but I'm not exactly. I would probably need the whole context just to be sure what was going on. Um, time to Google it. So, yeah. If we were, oh, I had. If we were given the initial conditions. The x1 evaluate, or sorry, x, are we using x, not x1, sorry. The x of zero is equal to two, and y of zero is equal to four. Then we can find the constant c1 and c2. Just like in a regular differential equation, if you're given the initial conditions, you can find the constants. So all we're going to do is we're actually going to plug in t equal to zero, x equal to two y equal to four. Let's see what happens. So we're gonna get x equal to two, y equal to four, equal to, so here's the nice thing about plugging in zero, e to the zero is one. So you're gonna get c1 times one, one, plus c2 times two, three. And there's a couple of different ways you can solve this. You could really, if you really wanted to, although you don't need to, you could write this as a matrix equation. And then you could like multiply both sides by the inverse if that's something you wanted to do. Typically, though, what people just do is they write it out. They say, I've got C1 plus 2C2 equal to 2. And I've got C1 plus 3C2 equal to 4. 
and then they like subtract them from each other. So if you do the top one minus the bottom one, you get two minus four equal to C1 minus C1 and two C2 minus three C2 is minus C2. So C2 is equal to two. And then you can plug that back into either equation and you get two plus, sorry, two equal to C1 plus four. So C1 equals negative two. It's especially nice if one of the eigenvectors has a zero in it, because if there was like a zero there, then it'd be obvious that two times C2 would have to be two, and then it's really easy to find everything. So if one of them has a zero, you like, yeah, just find the other one real quick. So what this would mean is that our particular solution is, x, y equal to 2e to the t times 1, 1. Oops, sorry, I got that backwards. It's a minus 2. My 2 is my c2. Plus 2e to the 2t times 2, 3. As much as I want to say more things. Okay, I can say that. Yeah, let's say that. So one thing we like to talk about when we, so I actually kind of where we're really going with this. Yeah, we have enough time. Yeah, we'll get going with it. Is that um, what happens to X and Y as T gets really, really large, right? What's the behavior of the system as time goes on and on and on and on? That's what we're really asking. So if I look at this, well, here I have x equal to negative 2e to the t plus 4e to the 2t. This part's going to minus infinity. This part's going to positive infinity. Which one's getting there faster? The first part or the second part? Right. The second one's going faster because it's got a bigger exponent. So this is going to infinity as t goes to infinity. And the same thing is true for y. y is equal to negative 2 e to the t plus 6 e to the 2 t. This one's going to outgrow that one. So it's going to infinity as t goes to infinity as well. So what this means for us, well, in fact, so instead of trying to draw the thing, I'll just use the picture I have here. So, so on Canvas, there are some links to some graphing utilities. And one of them is, says like, graphing a phase plane link or whatever. I don't remember exactly what it's called. Something. You, if you click on that, it'll take you to a place where you can enter like dx dt equals something times x plus something times y and dy dt equals something times x plus something like that. Make sure you read the instructions if you use it because like I think you have to use a specific symbol for multiplication. But if you do that, you can pull up a phase plane that looks like this, where you're essentially being given the direction, so the, the dx dt and the dy dt at any one point. So for example, in my equation, which I know I have, um, yeah, here it is right here. So in my equation, dx dt equals negative, wait, is this the same, like, is this the same equation? Sorry, I've got papers everywhere. Ah. Yeah, that's the same equation, okay. So except we're using x1 as an x2, it doesn't really matter, x1. So if I plugged in, for example, the point, x equal to one and y equal to one right there. Well, dx dt would be negative one plus two. So one, so I'd be moving one in the x direction and dy dt would be negative three plus four. I'd be moving one in the y direction. So it'd be going exactly in that direction over one and up one. And so this whole plane kind of shows you what's happening. And we can see that no matter where we start for x and y, eventually, X and Y, I should not say where, not, not no matter where we start. I take it back completely, not no matter where we start. If we started our initial conditions, which were X equal to, gosh, all my papers, X equal to two and Y equal to four. So if we start at the point two comma four, we can see, oh yeah, we're gonna go off in the direction where X and Y are both going to infinity, like we said. But if we started at a different initial condition, you might get something else. Like if we start here, you're going to be going this way. We're both x and y are going to negative infinity. 